On that day they read in the book of Moses and the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Now the Moabites and Ammonites, they could convert to Judaism and uh, worship the true God and then enter in, but so long as they stayed with their old traditions, there's just no way of it. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah, and Tobiah was an Ammonite. And Eliashib the priest had prepared for Tobiah a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offerings. Now this would have been one of the chambers around the temple. And we're told that it's a great chamber. Now this is a great sin. Not only is he making room for a pagan worshiper, but it's also an even larger chamber than the rest would have privy to. The frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priest. This no doubt he had furnished for his use, and here Tobiah lodged, in order that he and the high priest Eliashib might have more free and secret communication with each other, this being a place where the people might not come. But in all this time was not I, Nehemiah, at Jerusalem, for in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king. So he traveled back to Susa, it's believed, right over here. And after certain days obtained I leave of the king, and I came to Jerusalem, and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah, in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. So uh, Nehemiah is cleansing the temple. Who does that sound like? Well, Jesus, he does the same thing. He thrust out all the people in whom was uh, defiling the temple. So here we see a type of Christ in the final chapter of Nehemiah. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field, like this right here. The portion which the people had covenanted to contribute to the Levites had not been paid. The Levites, to escape starvation, had dispersed into the country. The temple services were therefore crippled. Compare the similar rebuke in Malachi 3. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place, then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. And I made treasurers over the treasuries, Shelemiah the priest, and Zedek the scribe, and of the Levites, Padeah. And next to them was Hanan, the son of Zechor, the son of Metaniah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. So he's putting the right men in charge over these very important offices. The reform was made effectual by organization. Eliashib the priest had failed in his duty, and the appointment of treasurers is now confirmed. One of the treasurers was a layman named Hanan, but they were all faithful men and are mentioned in connection with the building of the wall. Verse 14, Remember me, O God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God, and for the offices thereof. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, which was against the law, you weren't supposed to do that on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading gases, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals, you see, they wanted that money more than they wanted to obey God. There dwelt men of Tyre, to the north, in Lebanon. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah in Jerusalem. So they were allowing these traders, even Gentiles, to come in on the Sabbath. 
They just didn't care. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut, and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. That way, keeping these traitors out. And some of my servants said I at the gates, that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day, like carts and merchandise. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without outside Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? Why are you here? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates instead of his servants. You all watch the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod in uh, the Philistine land. Ashdod of Ammon and of Moab. They had married strangers, though not long before they had most solemnly promised not to do so back in Nehemiah chapter 10. So hard a thing it is perfectly to root out tares, which will be continually springing up again among the wheat. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language. They were so Gentile <laughs> that they couldn't even speak the Jewish language. But according to the language of each people, and I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Solomon, if you'll recall, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines, and he was David's son, the most blessed. He was a type of Christ, ruled over the largest territory that Israel has ever ruled over, and had the most money, the most wives, the most land of all his people, and yet his pagan wives led him into so much witchcraft and all this wicked things. And it is very much believed, though, that he repented before the end. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Joida, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. See how they're all connected and in cahoots, you see. Um, Tobiah and Sambalot have been vexing Nehemiah the entire time. And Eliashib, the high priest of Jerusalem, was in cahoots with them, making everything far more difficult. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers. And appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, every one in his business, and for the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. With these words, Nehemiah leaves the scene, committing himself and his discharge of duty to the righteous judge. His conscientious fidelity had brought him into collision not only with external enemies, but with many of his own brethren. His rigorous reformation has been assailed by many moralists and commentators in every age. And it may further be added that with these words, in the annals of Old Testament history. And that is it for the book of Nehemiah, my dear friends. Hope that you all learned something. Um, next, we're going to be getting into the book of Job, Lord willing. Very fascinating. I've already, I'm uh, quite a ways into it already. I've got everything set up, but uh, very, very fascinating. Don't, uh, definitely don't miss out on it. I thank you all for joining me. God of all peace be with you. Amen.